uh, it's both an honor and a privilege to uh, be sharing with you this weekend. Um, I want to welcome all seven of our locations as well uh, as those who are joining us online uh, and via podcast. Uh, I also want to give a big shout out to all of our fathers this weekend. Can we give a shout out to our fathers? <laughs> Happy Father's Day to you all. Hey, and speaking of, of uh, Father's Day, uh, I was thinking about my own dad, uh, and I, I was just reflecting on, uh, you know, some of the things that he said and done over the years, and in thinking about some of those things, I, I just can't help but think that the man might be half crazy. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, some of the things that he said and done over the years uh, have been just completely uh, against the grain, even now. He says and does things that are, are not normal. Uh, I was thinking about when I was about 12, uh, 10 or 12 years old, somewhere in that, in that age range. Uh, one day my dad was in the backyard, and uh, he had a weed eater, and he was you know, kind of trimming down some, some weeds and some grass. And, and all of a sudden he yelled out to me, so I came uh, to the back door, and, and he said, son, won't you come out of there on, a, on the back porch? Um, he said, I, I think uh, a snake may have bitten my boot. And so he begins to show me uh, his boot, and I can see two little holes there um, that look like, you know, it may have been from a, from a snake bite. He said, now, I just want you to stand here on the porch and watch me uh, just in case I pass out. Um, <laughs> you, can tell, you can tell someone what happened, and you can, you can call for, for help. Now, I, I don't have to tell you that that's not a normal response. Like, like no, normal people just don't do that kind of stuff. And you know, uh, if I had a dollar for every time uh, a family member, a friend, or a neighbor w would say, Mike, you're crazy, because that's my dad's name. I mean, I might be paid right now. Um, <laughs> but look, the older I get uh, and the more and more I reflect upon uh, my dad's, you know, uh, quote-unquote craziness and crazy uh, outbursts, the more I began to, to really see that maybe, you know, a small portion of that is, is crazy. I mean, the things that really caught me off guard uh, and the things that, that people would react to that they would say is crazy. Uh, I mean, it's just because they weren't normal responses. I mean, they, they were against the grain. They were unconventional. And my dad has always been a person who's shown up different in the world. Now, not in a weird way, and, and you might not be able to see it on the surface uh, per se. And, you know, crazy is, is what I would say, uh, and crazy is what, what other people might think. But over the years, my dad, when, when we would discourse, discourse about many things, he would always use this phrase, the Spirit of God. And he, was, he would talk about the Spirit of God. I would hear him say this hundreds and hundreds of times. And over time, I began to understand that much of how my dad shows up in the world is his response to the activity of the Spirit of God in his life. That causes him to have these responses that seem abnormal or go against the, the, the normal humanity and how we would respond in certain situations. Now, as we go through the Bible, we see several examples of this. We, we see several examples of the Spirit of God stirring people and their responses being abnormal. Uh, Abraham, let's just start right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. Abraham, God says, Abraham, listen, I want you to pack up all your stuff and I want you to move your family and all of those with you to a land that I will show you. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I kind of sometimes need to know where I'm going before I get there. I don't just get in my car and drive and figure out where I'm going to go. Like, I have a destination in mind. And keep in mind, Abraham is, is, is a very wealthy man, so he's got cattle and he's got people. and he's got all, So he didn't just put it in a U-Haul and just say, well, we're going to drive until God tells us to stop. So this was a huge undertaking and not a normal response by Abraham. And as a result, we can see that Abraham, uh, God richly blessed him um, in his life. And then there's another example, one of my favorites, uh, David, who um, was a young shepherd boy. He was a runt of the family, but God had anointed him to be king. But, but before that point, uh, David one day was on an Uber Eats run. Uh, his, his father, Jesse, had sent him to his brothers who were in the army, and they were, they were going up against the, the Philistine army, and the Philistine army had a champion named Goliath. And so David shows up on the scene with, with his food for his brothers, and he sees this, this giant that, that the Israelite army is afraid of. 
But, but David is so stirred by what, what Goliath is saying. He feels stirred in his spirit, and he feels like he needs to address this situation. And he says, you know what, I'm going to go out and fight this giant. Now, keep in mind now, David uh, has no military training. He's not in the army. As a matter of fact, he only has a bag of rocks and a slingshot to go up against this giant. And if you know the story, he, he does eventually kill this giant. He's stirred by God's spirit to address a situation and responds in a way that nobody else was responding. Then there's Nehemiah. Nehemiah, a young man who's uh, got it good. He, he's, he's moved on up in life and he's uh, working for a king uh, at this particular time uh, in his life. But then he hears about his people who are in disarray and, and his land that has been uh, destroyed and his heart breaks. And so, so he prays about what to do and he feels stirred in his spirit to address this desperate situation. Now, there, it says nowhere in the story that uh, Nehemiah was an engineer. It says nowhere in the story that uh, he flipped houses back in the day. It, it said nowhere in the story that he uh, had the skill set to manage a group of people to go and rebuild a city wall. Yet Nehemiah is stirred in his spirit and he goes and not only does he collect people to help him, but they rebuild this wall in record time. We can fast forward to the New Testament and we see Jesus who was born of, of Mary, who was a virgin, and, and that was a miracle within itself, uh, an act of the Spirit of God. But, but Jesus quoting Isaiah 61 and, and Luke 4, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, to free prisoners, to, to set the oppressed free. And then Jesus says, after he's raised from the dead, he says, uh, to his disciples, now you will receive this same spirit and you will receive power to go and be my witnesses. And then my last example, and this is kind of where I want to land today, is a guy by the name of Paul. Paul uh, was a man who was transformed by God's spirit. Uh, on a road to Damascus. Now, what you need to know about Paul is Paul hated Christians, and Paul was persecuting uh, Christians. But all of a sudden, on this road to Damascus one day, he's going to persecute Christians. Uh, God speaks to him, knocks him down off of his horse, and he has this radical transformation. And so he goes from uh, persecuting Christians to becoming a Christ follower himself. And then not only that, he then goes and begins to establish the, the early church, and then his letters become a theological foundation for us as we read throughout the New Testament. So if there's anyone who's qualified to talk to us about how the Holy Spirit transforms our life, taking us from one end of the spectrum to the other, I believe that is Paul. And so this weekend... I thought it would be appropriate for us to just zoom in on some of Paul's words to a group of Christians that he's writing to in a region called Galatia. Um, if you have a Bible, we will be in Galatians chapter number five. Uh, we won't leave you hanging. We'll put the words up on the screen for you. You guys uh, can follow along with us in just a moment. But before we do that, allow me to just give you some geographical, uh, sociological, uh, and theological kind of context for kind of what's happening in Galatia. What's, what's going on uh, with these people that, uh, that Paul is writing to? First of all, Galatia is in modern-day Turkey. Um, we're not historically certain as to the social scene and what's kind of going on in, in these cities socially, Paul doesn't really give us the same evidence or, or uh, uh, background that he gave us when he wrote to the church of Corinth. So we're not really sure of that. We're also not sure of what's the socioeconomic status of these Christians. But here's one thing that we do know. We know that Paul is concerned. And Paul is concerned because he's saying, you who call yourselves Christ followers, you are following a different gospel, which is actually not a gospel at all. This is what he says in the opening book of uh, opening chapter of, of, of Galatians. And we know that the main issue of concern here is coming from the Jewish Christians 
who would have been uh, opposed to Paul. And what they were doing was they were trying to influence uh, the Galatian people to be circumcised. They were putting a lot of emphasis on circumcision. And you have to understand that that was the entry point for those uh, who wanted to be uh, in, the, the, in the faith, basically. Uh, it was a, it was a Jew, Jewish tradition that you be, had to be circumcised. And this is important to note because the majority of, of, of the letter to the people in Galatia, Paul is writing about this whole thing around the law and circumcision. So he's laying this foundation. He spends a good amount of time talking about it, but he says, listen, we are saved by faith in Christ alone, Amen. not by works, not by this religious tradition, not by these rituals, but we are saved by our faith in Christ alone. And so after he lays his foundation, he then turns his attention to this one little idea at the end of Galatians that we want to focus in on. So, so we're going to pick it up in verse number 13 in Galatians chapter number five, where Paul is talking to us about life according to the Spirit. Listen to what he says. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And he's saying this part about being free because the law, it, it had a lot of weight and a lot of things that you had to do that was burdensome. But well, Paul is saying you're called to be free. But now that you're free of the law, he said, listen, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Let me just pause right there real quick and let you help you understand that. Most of what Paul is writing in the New Testament is very sociological in nature where he's talking to them about how they interact and engage with one another because there was a lot of Jewish and Gentile clashing culturally. So he's telling them, you guys have to learn how to engage with one another and love one another. And so this is what he's talking about here. Then he goes on verse 16. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not uh, to do whatever you want. But, tell the person next to you, but. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who, are, who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I got another but for you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance. That word also means patience and long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. I want to just talk for a few moments uh, in the time I have left using this little subject. The Spirit helps us show up different. Yes. The Spirit helps us show up different. Um, there are so many things that I can unpack in, in all of these verses uh, that, that we just read, and I would love to to take some time to exegetically examine all of those things. But, um, you know, we don't have time to do that. Now, I could take you to some churches where three and four hour services is nothing. Uh, but that's not how we roll. Uh, so we're so we going to keep this thing. We're going we gonna to keep this thing rolling. Uh, but before we before we drill down, I, I just want to I just want to point out that Paul is is uniquely qualified to write this letter. He's uniquely qualified to challenge these Christians in this way. One, because he is a Jew. 
He was circumcised. He's formally trained and educated in the Judaic law. So he, he knows what he's talking about. Paul has also experienced the transformative power of what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up in your life and, and completely turns you around. He's also seen this happen amongst the people that he has ministered to. And so Paul knows both uh, experiences and he knows both perspectives. So I just want to zoom in on two things, two, two thoughts, two ideas that illuminate from what we just uh, read today, and then I'll, I'll get out of your way. Paul is contextually here talking about where we take our guidance from. He spent all of this time talking about the law, and then he shifts gears and says, listen, that's not where we take our guidance from, not the law. He is then specifically talking about the spirit, but, but then he talks about how the, the spirit and the flesh are in contrast with one another. Listen to what he says in verse 17. He says, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. The first point I want to zoom in on for you uh, this weekend is the flesh and the spirit are in constant conflict. The flesh and the spirit are in constant conflict. Now, none of us really needed Paul to tell us that. I mean, this is not really a revelation to us. I mean, we, we, we know that we have, we have moments where we don't make such good decisions. We know we have moments of weakness. We know that our flesh is weak at times. We, we understand that. We, we know that we're often tempted by uh, not so good ideas. You know, maybe sometimes it's related to you know, what we eat, you know, should I eat this donut or this bagel or, you know, uh, drink this coffee or, or, or juice or what? I'm describing the things we serve here at church on, sun, on Sunday sometimes. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't tempt you in that way. But, and I'm not saying those things are bad <laughs> per se. They're, they're, they're not bad per se. But, but, but we often have these decision, decisions around what we consume, right? Or sometimes it's how we interact with one another. You know, it, it's should I send this email uh, in this moment when I feel really frustrated? Should I have this conversation or should I give myself space to decide whether I should or not? And would it change what I say or even if I do say it? Should I say yes to this opportunity that seems good? Should I say no uh, to this opportunity because I'm, I'm concerned or afraid or whatever the case may be? We, we, we have these moments, and we all have plenty of examples of these moments. Some we are cool to share, some we will never share. But listen to the, 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 the guidance that Paul gives us. He, he says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the flesh. I mean, it just sounds really simple, right? But what, here's what Paul is saying, in essence. He's saying that, our point of reference or the spirit should be our point of reference. Now, we constantly find ourselves in moments of conflict all the time. Sometimes these are big conflicts. Sometimes they are not. Sometimes they're external conflicts. Sometimes they're internal. But we always find ourselves in places of conflict, right? And those moments of conflict require decisions of us. So what Paul is saying, your point of reference for how you decide should not be based on your flesh. It should be based on the spirit. That is the point of reference. And let me just say this, because I think when we read what Paul says when he's talking about, you know, uh, uh, the acts of the flesh, you know, sexuality and, you know, drunkenness and all these sorts of things, which it is true. But, but let me just bring it down just a little bit, because sometimes satisfying our flesh is not about a physical indulgence. It, it's, it's not. Sometimes it's more about just the, the human need to be comfortable. We just want to be comforted. We want to be comfortable. And listen, nine times out of ten, if I got a choice, I'm not choosing to be uncomfortable. If it's up to me, I'm not choosing it. But that's why we have coaches. That's why we have people in our lives to push us, nudge us, help us do stuff that we, we maybe wouldn't do if we didn't have that influence in our lives. And the Spirit of God works through those people sometimes in our lives. And here's the thing. Sometimes the best decision for us is the uncomfortable decision. 
It's not what our flesh wants, but it's what we need. And the goal for those of us who are trying to follow the path of Christ and, and we're trying to be Christ followers, the goal for, uh, for us who call ourselves Christian is to be like Christ. Well, have you read the life of Christ? I mean, a lot of stretching, a lot of things that would, would have been uncomfortable. And so in essence, that's what we're signing up for. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us because if it's up to me, I ain't doing it. I ain't feeling it. Not today, maybe not tomorrow, and maybe not next week. God's Spirit is constantly drawing us in that direction. Constantly wanting us to look like Christ. The second point I want to zoom in on for us uh, this weekend is to walk or live by the Spirit requires consistent commitment. To walk and live by the Spirit requires consistent commitment. Now, right here, a, a very practical question that is probably turning in some of your heads is, how do I walk or live by the Spirit. How do I do what Paul is just simply stating we should do? Well, listen to what he says. He says in verse 18 that we should be led by the Spirit, which sounds very familiar to what he's saying in verse 16 when he's saying uh, walk by the Spirit, right? But it, it really isn't because you cannot be led by anything or anyone without some level of submission. Without giving up some, some control or, or giving up some part of your will, you, you, just, you just can't do it. There's a permission you have to give. Come on. So if walking by the Spirit means the Spirit is our point of reference that we talked about in verse 16, then being led by the Spirit is our point of reverence. There, there, there's, there's, there's a deference there. There's a respect. There's an honor, which then points to submission. Meaning we have chosen to submit ourselves. Because you can have a point of reference that you don't submit to. It's not necessarily the, the same thing. Pastor Mark last week gave us this equation, and so I'm just going to borrow this from him. Uh, last week he said... Uh, an awareness of the Spirit plus the submission to the Spirit equals filled by the Spirit. And let me tell you what that looks like. It, it, a consistent commitment looks like spiritual disciplines. That's what it looks like. It looks like prayer, regularly talking to God. It looks like reading Scripture, regularly reading the words that have been written to us to give us guidance. It looks like fasting, which is something that we're in the middle of, where, where we give up something to say that, that I, I want to in this time draw closer. And these are just normal things that you would do when you're building a relationship. It's the basics. Let me just tell you this quick story. Um, there, there's a guy uh, by the name of Alan Stein who lives in our area, and Alan uh, was a, a, a former basketball trainer. He's trained, uh, you know, some, some great names. If I named you, you would know some of these folks. But Alan is now a speaker and a writer, and he tells this story about Kobe Bryant and how he um, had heard that, that Kobe had these crazy workouts that he would do. And so Alan, while he was uh, doing his training thing, he was out in, I think, Vegas, and, and Nike was doing uh, a camp that, that Kobe was, was going to be helping to lead. And so Alan goes up to Kobe, and he says, Kobe, listen, I heard that you have these ridiculous training uh, regiments that I want to see for myself. So, so can I just come sit and observe to see what you're doing? Kobe said, yeah, man, that's all good. Uh, just meet me at 4 o'clock. And so Alan said, hey, well, that's the same time that the camp is going on. Uh, Kobe said, no, 4 o'clock in the morning. 
So, so Allen, not deterred, he said, okay, uh, I'm going to show Kobe that I'm serious about what I do and that I'm a serious trainer. I'm actually going to beat Kobe to the gym. So I'm going to wake up at 3 o'clock. I'm going to catch a cab, and I'm going to get there before Kobe gets there. So he catches the cab, and he gets there, and he pulls up, and he sees uh, the lights are on in the gym, and he gets out of the cab, and he faintly hears a basketball bouncing, and then he walks in the door, and Kobe is already in a full sweat doing his warm-up before the workout. And so Allen comes in, and he sits down, and he's so intrigued, and, and he's watching Kobe, and, and he's bored out of his mind because Kobe is doing the most basic and the most fundamental things that Allen says, I teach middle school basketball players. And so I sit there and I watch, and when the workout is over, uh, I leave. I don't speak to Kobe. I don't speak to the, to, to the trainer but curiosity just gets to me uh, later on in the day. So when we had the camp session, I go up to Kobe and I said, Kobe, I I'm just curious. I, I sat and watched you uh, 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 minute after minute uh, do these very fundamental drills. And, and, and I'm just wondering why you're doing such basic things. And Kobe's response is, why do you think I'm the best in the world? Because I never get bored with the basics. And see, Kobe understands that his commitment to the basics help him show up differently. Yes, yes. He's got talent. He's got that. But his commitment to the basic things help him show up differently. And his commitment to the basic things is tied to his love for the game. These are not things that Kobe has to do, but he recognizes that if I'm going to show up different, I've got to be committed to these things. In, in essence, Paul is telling us the same thing. He's saying life walking by and being led by the Spirit, that, that's our point of reference, and that's our point of reverence. That, that's, that's our example that we look at, and then that's, that's how we need to be submitted, because that is how we get empowered to live the life that God desires for us. The problem is we see the greatness of the Kobe's and we see the greatness of the people that we admire, but we don't see the sacrifice to the basics that really make them who they are. Let me see if I can land a plane for you this weekend and just sum this up. Um, about the year 1485, uh, Italian painter, Filipino Lippi, uh, painted a, a portrait called The Virgin and the Child with Saints Jerome and Dominic. And for many years, critics deemed this perspective in this painting to be off. They, they said that the hills and the surrounding landscape were out of balance, almost like they were going to fall out, at, out of the painting itself. Saint Jerome and, and Saint Dominic uh, look awkward and, and uncomfortable. But it wasn't until this art critic uh, named Robert Cumming realized that the previous critics had the wrong perspective. They had been looking at the painting standing up. But Lippi had intended for the painting to be an aid in prayer. And he had intended for people to look at the painting as they were kneeling. And so when Cumming changed his posture, and kneeled looking at the painting, everything shifted. The proper perspective came into view, and all of these little things that he had missed before were now clearly viewed by him, and, and he was able to see them in the proper proportion. Listen, the same is true for us when it comes to the life in the flesh versus the spirit. Our flesh, our human desires, our concerns often limit our perspective, causing us to draw conclusions based on an improper perspective, based on how we feel, based on what we see, based on what we think. But a life walking by and being led by the Spirit, as Paul speaks of in Galatians 5, it helps us to have the right point of reference and the right perspective. Listen, it's possible for us to be looking at the right thing and still have the wrong perspective. This is 
what establishing an intimate relationship with God through, D- through Jesus does for us. The same spirit that what was in Jesus is at work in us. But it is the consistency or, or, or a commitment to be consistent in our growth and intimacy with God that allows us to get on the right wavelength, that ultimately allows us to show up different in the world around us. And then Paul says that if we do this, we will see evidence. And the evidence is the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But get this, not defined based off of our flesh's perspective. Because the Spirit defines it very, very differently. And, and when we embrace that, they show up very differently in the world. Because love is not just for the people that we're down with. It's not just our friends. It's not the folks we cool with, the people that vote like us. No, 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 no. Jesus said, hold up, buddy. Hold up. Love your enemies, too. Matter of fact, bless those who persecute you. We don't like that part, but, but that's what it says. And that's what life in it, that's how love shows. It, it confounds people. How in the world can you love someone who murdered your family? How in the world can you love people who hate your people? It's life in the spirit. Joy. And that's not about happiness because happiness means that I got good things happening. But I might not have good things happening in my life, but I can still have joy because it's not based on my circumstances. Come on. Doesn't mean that things are down or, or up, or it, it actually doesn't matter either way. Peace. Listen, it don't mean that I don't have chaos going on in my life. I, I might not have the calmness that I want. I might be in the midst of, of, of a storm. But listen, I might not know what's going on. I might not know how I'm going to get out of it. I might not know where I'm going to end up. I might not know when it's going to end. But guess what? I know who. I know who holds my future. Matter of fact, back in the day, there was a song that said, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. The living is God's spirit in us. All fear is gone because he lives in me. It doesn't mean that it's not crazy all around us. Listen, I don't have time to go through all the spirits, and then I'm getting a little bit too, I'm sorry, all the fruits of the spirit, I'm getting a little bit excited. Amen. But let me just, let me just park it right here, because if I was in black church, I'd need an organ to keep going. Um, <laughs> Paul says this, simply, very simply. Paul says, the flesh and the spirit are in constant conflict. Right. He states it very plainly. Again, not a revelation for us. We, we know that. But only a consistent commitment to walk by and be led by the spirit is what produces fruits of the spirit. Amen. Not fruits according to our interpretation of how love, joy, and peace are supposed to work. But notice how, and even I did it, we stop at love, joy, and peace. We, don't, we ain't talking about patience and long-suffering. and We don't like those fruits. We don't, those ain't the fruits. We, you know, we passing by that in the store. No, we're not, we not picking those up. But, 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 but a consistent commitment to live by the Spirit based on our spiritual disciplines is how we show up different in the world. Because here's the thing. You don't have the ability to love like you need to love. You don't have the ability to have joy in the midst of craziness like you can. You don't have the ability within your flesh to do it. And, and Paul is saying, hey, you can go get circumcised. You can do all of these other things. But it's life in the spirit. That's where it's at. 
Now, this ain't like it feels good or it's going to be, you know, something all exciting all the time. No, but I promise you this. There will be evidence. And then check this out. When you live a life according to the Spirit, then you start picking up uh, points of reference of the Spirit. So when you get in certain situations in the future, you're like, oh, he, I remember when this happened before. And, and, and he could open this door. This time. Oh, I remember when I was in it. You begin to, to get more confidence. And then you can help those around you live a better life because they're looking at the fruits that you're producing. So my prayer for you this weekend is that if you really are a Christ follower or you really want to grow in your relationship with Christ and you really want to, you, you really want to go to the next level, well, we got to have a commitment to be led by the Spirit. And that requires submission. And oh, by the way, that requires us to embrace this little curse word that we have in church world called obedience. And so that's my prayer for us this weekend. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for how you show up in our lives. Through Jesus, giving us an example of how we ought to live. Now, God, I know we pick and choose the examples that we, we like. You know, we like, you know, some of the miracles, but we don't ever want to be uh, in need of a miracle. I know we, 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 we like how you bless and, and how you do all of these things that f- make us feel good. But there, there are also times where you need us to embrace the struggle. You need us to embrace the hard things because you're trying to grow us and you're trying to stretch us. And so, God, help us, help us to, to, to bring back to our remembrance that you're trying to produce fruits of the Spirit in us. And so, God, help us to humble ourselves and to understand that our flesh and our spirit are in constant conflict. But a consistent commitment to be led by the Spirit with our disciplines and how we pray and read Scripture and we fast will help us show up different. All these things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen.